Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another week of the Daily Friends Show. Another wonderful week in South Africa as we grapple with the many uh, scandals, stories, and all that good stuff uh, that we that we deal with here on this show. I'm your host, Nicholas Larimer, and I'm going to be joined today by uh, the Ministry of Truth Fellows, that is Terence Corrigan. Terence, how are you this morning? Good, good night, yourself. I'm very good, thank you. And Mr. Marius Ruert. Marius, how are you? Hello, comrades. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> it's very appropriate that you say that because <laughs> our first story today, and you may have gotten from the headline, is that apparently, according to Nkosasana at Lamini Zuma, um, our, our, our overlord during the height of the lockdown, uh, the enemy operates amongst us. What am I talking about? Nkosu Sanad Lamini Zuma gave a speech to the uh, to the Young Communist League at WITS uh, that was on the, uh, the the Chris Harney Memorial Lecture on Saturday, and the title of this of the lecture was "Saving the Soul of the ANC from the Claws of Factionalism and Neoliberal Policies." Now, uh, this story, this this lecture has been published in full on IOL, which is <laughs> well known as the kind of mouthpiece of the, of the Zuma faction. Um, and I and I suggest if you're interested in kind of getting an idea of where the ANC's headspace is ideologically, you should go check out that uh, that entire lecture. It's quite long. But she goes through a number of things. She talks about, um, she says that the ANC's view is that despite the gains recorded by the, what she calls the de developmental democratic state, the tyranny of the market has gained, gained gravitas. Uh, she goes on to say that this was noted by the ANC conference and that despite the economic advances, the legacies of colonialism and apartheid are still deeply entrenched. She talks about the need to decolonize education. Um, she says a whole number of things, lots of praise for characters such as Che Guevara um, and, uh, and Engels. Um, but here's the quote that I think what got put in the headline that stands out to a lot of us, which is, this phase of our revolution is perhaps the most testing, as the enemy is now unseen and operates amongst us, persuading some to abandon the revolutionary spirit of the Congress movement. However, as you enter into this battle, remember what Comrade Chris Harney said, uh, what Comrade Shea Guevara said, the revolution is made by man, but man must forge his revolutionary spirit from day to day. She concludes it with a quote from a letter um, from, from Frederick Engels to Adolf Sorge um, the day after Karl Marx died, where she says, where he, he says in, in the letter, the struggle of the proletariat continues, that victory is certain. So a lot of ANC ideology. Um, let me start with you, Morris. What do you make of this phrase? The enemy is now unseen and operates amongst us. It's got a very ominous ring to it, and I must say, I don't really like it in a in a democratic context. Mm. I'm not sure what that means. I mean, does she mean that the ANC is being infiltrated by, you know, these terrible neoliberals or something, or people who think that the market maybe isn't a, a bad thing? I mean, I, I really don't know what it means. But also, I uh, also don't like, as uh, I agree with you, I don't like this use of the word enemy to describe people that disagree with you in a democratic country. Like, we, the, I mean, the the DA and the EFF on the ANC's enemies, they're their opponents. And I mean, that's also, that's also one of the problems I have actually with the EFF, that they've brought this kind of war talk into the, the mainstream. But I mean, that also comes partly from the ANC. Who, I mean, and I mean, the EFF and the ANC are still pretty close, I think. So, but I mean... <laughs> All this uh, kind of rhetoric, it's just, it could have been cut and paste from a, a document from some, uh, you know, uh, party from uh, the fighting against colonization in the 1960s and just about anywhere in the in Africa, you know, it's like really, this kind of really backwards looking uh, way of, and it also, the ANC talks about being, uh, you know, about the revolution and so on. I mean, they've been in charge for 20, 27 years. Uh, I mean, they, they they shouldn't be talking about a revolution. They've had they've had com complete control of the uh, politically of the country for I mean, basically a generation. So you know, this continued talk about revolutions and being revolutionaries is like you you guys aren't the rev you are guys aren't revolutionaries. You're the establishment, which is fine. But then stop blaming, stop claiming that you're revolutionaries and and uh, whatever the case is. But there was one um, quite a. a also telling uh, Lania that we just uh, mentioned before we started podcasting her. Uh, so she says, uh, so what must be done? We must therefore deconcentrate economic and work opportunities away from the state, at least on uh, at least at local level. 
For so, for so long as the rural child in Winnie Marquisela Mandela Municipality in the Eastern Cape only sees the municipal manager or the mayor as the most successful person in the area, then services of self will thrive. We must create economic opportunities where the people live as anticipated by the RDP. So you think, I mean, that's actually so like that's actually quite a heartening thing to say. She's like, you know, the state isn't the one that must be creating jobs and so on. But then she finishes the paragraph by saying this to facilitate for this and also inculcate the culture of long-term planning. We are currently implementing the district development model which is basically, you know, this uh, a bureaucrat in uh, Pretoria will be telling somebody who lives in, you know, in Bazana in the Eastern Cape, this is, uh, you know, this is the factory you must build, these are how many people you must employ and so on. So it's like almost, it's almost as if, uh, you know, some sense wants to break through, but there's this ANC uh, kind of uh, immunity to it. You know, I think, I think they've taken a vaccine against right. it, not in good sense, I don't know. You know <laughs> so. <laughs> so, so there's there's also a, a bit in the speech where she talks about um, the need for a strong, efficient state and a patriotic private sector, which is such a loaded term that I think uh, mm. speaks speaks very ill of what they how the ANC views the private sector. Although, to be fair, at least it's not she's not calling for full nationalisation of the economy. Yes. <laughs> um, no, not yet, at least. Anyway, uh, Terence, what do you make of this this whole speech and this line in particular? Um, uh, it's, some will say, oh, this is just the Zuma faction. This is not Cyril. But I think that we probably all agree that this this is a more honest reflection of the ANC's ideological center than perhaps the rhetoric that Cyril sometimes says at business forums. I'm not sure that, that, that there's a huge difference, really. That um, If you... If you take out the the, the the rhetorical flourishes and the references to Che Guevara, um, you know, uh, uh, Ramaphosa is also on record with uh, uh, with his uh, uh, protestations of the beauties of socialism and things like that. Secondly, um, the idea of a of a statist path to the economic future, I think that that's universal in the ANC. Um, the private sector, you know, whether you want to call it, uh, you know, patriotic or not, or uh, you know, highlight or or downplay its its um, its contribution. At the end of the day, uh, what what the ruling party has taught, you know, um, uh, has in mind, is this omniscient, uh, benevolent, developmental state that will discipline capital, and you know, uh, lead us to the great uh, uh, the great the great sunlit uplands. Um, no, look, it's 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 stuck in the past. Um, it's nostalgic more than anything, I think, and maybe that's not um, maybe that's not entirely surprising, given that this is uh, uh, that this is homage to 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 to, to Chris Harney, who I think has been kind of ripped out of out of uh, whatever contextual reality he existed in. And has been held up as the sort of uh, you know what what would have been for South Africa because there's no way he would have been corrupt or whatever and you know it would have been so been so much better and I've seen this again and again and again. Uh, well, we really have no way of knowing he was never he was never put um, uh, put to that sort of test. Um, right now, I, I spoke to my father this morning about this and he said they really have not moved beyond Moscow. Yeah, and that's it's true. It's still that's still the ideological center of the universe for the for many in the ANC. Look, just just, just sort of put this put this into perspective. Um, we have had uh, two and a half decades of the ANC. They inherited a massive problem, and I think you know for, for you know maybe that first decade you could um, uh, you, you could cut them a great deal of a uh, great deal of slack. Um, I think that uh, during Mbeki's presidency, in some ways, they started to. Um, they started to make um, uh, make progress, but you know, as, far, as far as this rhetoric about enemies goes, uh, one of the most chilling documents to come out of um, uh, to come out of post-apartheid South Africa was something in Becky himself wrote: "The enemy maneuvers, but it remains the enemy." If you look at ANC documents from the 1990s, they you know they talk about um, um, uh, Nelson Mandela's speech at the 1997 conference in Mafeking. The, this 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 paranoid fixation that there is this enemy out to get them, which they explicitly said in some instances, you know, includes people who operate legally. Um, you know, it, it 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 wasn't enough to be loyal to the constitution or the flag or whatever. You know, it was 
seeking to displace the the people. I mean, this is the you know the idea of Jacobin democracy. Um, so yeah, um, but we uh, we made progress for you know for the, uh, for the first 10, 10 to thirteen years, and I think we've gone we've gone backwards. Um, now uh, let's let's put that into in, into perspective. The Korean War ended in nineteen fifty three. Korea was absolutely devastated. Yes, they got aid, and yes, they um, uh, they had um, uh, they had access to to to, uh, to American markets, which was uh, you know as as much of a national security as a um, as an economic thing. But by 1978, the equivalent period of time, uh, South Korea was start, was uh, was going to crest the world with a number of PhDs. You know. They went from a country whose economy was based on guano and bird feathers, you know, to one that was producing high quality consumer electronics and, um, and, and yes, and you know, ships as well. And ships, yeah. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, this, let's talk about the developmental state. Well, you know, in, um, uh, in South Korea, that's sort of what you had. Industrial policy played, played a big part, overseen by a civil service that knew what it was doing. That employed its best and its brightest. Yeah, lots of corruption, whatever. But you know, it greased the wheels as opposed to stealing the wheels. Now in South Africa, um, how many of those rural municipalities are, are even functional? Uh, you mm -hmm. know, just at a at, um, at a minimal level that can get you your your water and electricity. Um, secondly, you know, whereas the, the the Koreans could could stress by not having enough PhDs, even though they were, as I say, right up there in the world by that time. Uh, you know, we worry about school leavers not being able to read and write. Could there be something other than these dreadful neoliberals sneaking around and infiltrating and, you know, hiding under your bed at night? Right. No, exactly. Um, uh, you know, it's. I think I think one should take the, the, the statistics that come out of the People's Republic of China quite uh, with a grain of salt. Um, uh, but it's pretty clear that there's been some kind of massive transformation. By the official statistics, they've reduced absolute poverty from being two thirds of their population in about 1990 um, to being, you know, less than a percent today. So that's almost an equivalent timescale, right? Uh, and, and China's done this amazing thing. And India is also now making extraordinary progress on that, despite COVID and all these other things. So I think uh, when people say, you know, defenders of the ANC say it hasn't had enough time. Well, I'm not sure about that. Um, Marius, any final thoughts on this before we move on? Uh, no, I just want to say I think it's good that you mentioned India too, because they, um, I mean, South Korea, when it uh, did quite well, it wasn't uh, democracy as far as I know. It was, uh, you know, not in the true sense of the term, and China obviously isn't. So, and uh, Vietnam's also done similar. Uh, similarly in uh, reducing poverty and that's also I mean it's a, a one-party state you know there's no real freedom of speech in Vietnam but then I think it's important to point at India which is, uh, definitely doesn't have de definitely has its fair share of problems now but it's still kind of a democracy uh, even given with what Narendra Modi has been doing I mean there's some worrying things coming out of India but I think it's just important to know that a country can also be democratic and fight and and reduce poverty significantly and uh, right. we've seen that in um, a number of uh, other places, uh, Eastern Europe especially, we've seen, seen that, that kind of thing happen. So, yeah, uh, just uh, democracy and uh, economic development uh, can definitely uh, happen at, uh, together. Right. And I, I think Indonesia is also actually kind of an example of that. So it is a dysfunctional democracy. I'm not going to tell you that it's a, mm. a well-functioning free, free society. Um, but it's having pretty good economic growth despite its incredible dysfunction. And it shows that if you just get some of the basics right, like, for example, not viewing capital as the enemy that needs to be disciplined um, you're probably going to make a lot of progress uh even without fixing Malaysia is also a good example i think yeah exactly exactly anyway um so yeah check that out it's on iol uh, i forgot to say at the beginning of the show that uh, of course we know about the big fire that's raging across cape town i think it's still burning as we're talking now and uh, uh, a lot of UCT has unfortunately been caught in the blaze, as far as we can tell. Um, we're going to cover that story later this week when it uh, when more details emerge. I know there was a report that someone had been arrested for setting fires on Table Mountain. It's not clear how all of this is connected, so we're going to wait for more details to come out before we talk about that. All right. Um, with that out of the way, let us move on to our next story. And this is about my uh, or South Africa's favorite politician. 
former Nelson Mandela Bay councillor Andile Lumgisa, who uh, was found guilty by a court of smashing a heavy jo glass jug over the head of a DA councillor during a council meeting. Um, he was found guilty of assault and he was sentenced to a, a time in prison. I can't remember how much it was. I think it was two years or something. And uh, he managed to get out on parole after about a month, mysteriously. He was also carried into the prison by his ANC comrades on their shoulders uh, while they sang songs of lament. Um, but he doesn't appear to have stayed in there very long. So a miscarriage of justice, as far as I'm concerned. However, uh, the DA councillor, which is Reno Kayser, actually took him to court and sued him in his personal capacity for damages. And the court has now awarded uh, uh, Councillor uh, Kayser 844,000 rand uh, in damages for the assault that uh, Lungisa committed. Uh, Lungisa... <laughs> responded on social media that they can take my cats. I only own two cats. That's all they can have for me. <laughs> so, so he's an animal lover, which is nice. Apparently. Although he's willing to give them away. So how much does he do? <laughs> Terrence, this story is a mess, but at least it looks like the court is now putting another sanction on him. Um, although, of course, now they have to actually get the money. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of this story? Well, look, I'd just love first like to make an observation that carrying someone into prison, doesn't, doesn't that just seem like a distillation of everything that is dystopian about South Africa? But, you know, um, uh, yeah, just, just work that one out for yourself. Carrying into prison, not carrying out of prison. Um, what, um, what do I see beyond that? Um, yeah, look, it's it's. It's good that uh, uh, that he seems to have been given um, uh, given a severe severe reprimand by the court. Whether that will be enforceable, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I I don't I I think that although they are under under, under intense pressure, it is not so much our formal systems that uh, you know where where our problems lie. It is the way that they that 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 the the culture that should you know uh, which to which they should be the backstop um, is failing. So yes, you you are carrying someone into prison. He stays. I think it was two months. So you know, got, got another month of a two year sentence. Um, does the name Tony and Gani mean anything to you? Um, you uh, remember that that um, uh, uh, according to to uh, a little Google search I did, um, Mister uh, Mister Nungisa was also. Uh, uh, in hot water some time ago for using racist invective against the governor of the Reserve Bank, including uh, the the word that dare not speak its name. Apparently, he, apolog he apologized for that. Um, but you know, evidently there there's there's one rule for um, uh, you know for Andili Linguisa and other rules for certain other people, including uh, in comparable circumstances certain uh, uh, administrators of certain London-based universities. <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, I, I don't know. It's, this this is the sort of, the sort of thing that, 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 that really does make me despair. Um, this, you know, it, it, one of those water jugs is big and heavy and you take bring it down with enough force and someone, you can kill him. Um, yet this is something we... Not only is this guy being able to the, in the criminal system to kind of walk between the raindrops, but he assumes he's going to be able to do it in the civil system as well. I, you know, I do hope that there is some line drawn somewhere. Although, to be honest, I'm not going to hold my breath. Right. I mean, can you imagine uh, if, if I don't know, David Mania or something from the DA uh, <laughs> did something similar to a to an ANC minister? It would be the end of the universe. The, <laughs> it would be a completely different thing. You, you David know, Mania uh, would be put in a in a cell and never see the light of day again. Yeah, actually, here yeah, uh, the there is a little comparator. Um, was late nineteen nineties, one member of, if I remember, one member of the of the DP and one member of the of the National Party. Or no, no hold on, I, I think I, I think I think it was a Nat and a guy from the ANC, but I remember both of them were white Afrikaans guys. Um, Johnny Delanga was the NC guy. Yes, yes, that's correct. They he had was Deputy Minister altercation. of Justice for a time, I think. Right. Uh, they had this altercation on the floor. One guy came and planted the other one, and then they kind mm. of went fisticuffs. Fingen Walla, I think, 
suspended them both for a couple of days. Now, this was, uh, you know, it was um, just a bit of bare knuckle boxing, and uh, it was more a breach of decorum than anything. But at least at that stage, there was some sort of consequence for it. That you know, you don't just go and plant the oak a shot, you know, because he, uh, uh, you know, he was checking you skier for whatever. Now, it was, you know, this is criminal assault with a potentially deadly weapon. I mean, it's bizarre. I agree. Uh, Morris, any, anything to add to, to what Terence has said? You, you had a good rant before the show. And, uh, I to recreate <laughs> yeah. some of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, as Terence says, it seems there's one rule for Andil Lungisa and different rule for others. But also, it's, it's quite mind-boggling that the ANC hasn't expelled somebody like Lungisa, who, I mean, there's been rumors of corruption around him. I don't know if he's ever been found guilty or anything like that. But I mean, the man, as Terence says, he had assaulted somebody with a potential deadly weapon. And this isn't hearsay. It happened on camera. There are clips floating around of him hitting right. this poor guy yeah, in the head. Guilty. Exactly. So this isn't just hearsay or somebody says, yeah, about Andile, what he did. You know, he's he smashed somebody in the face, also in front of our many councillors, 100 councillors and staff or whatever the case is. But as I was saying before, this, this shows, I mean, just thinking, uh, uh, just to uh, disclaim, I didn't watch the funeral, but I've read about it. So this is talking about Prince Philip's funeral on the weekend. Uh, so as far as I can tell, all the COVID regulations were uh, followed. They are uh, like, as the UK is at the moment for funerals, the queen had to sit by herself. She couldn't, nobody could sit around her and comfort her and so on. And I was thinking this shows the difference in political culture between the UK and South Africa. We've seen at the heart of COVID, we saw, I think it was Andrew Malangani's funeral, was it? But anyway, somebody's funeral. And... That it was packed. People were not social distancing. People weren't wearing masks and what have you, which whatever you think about uh, the lockdown rules and so on, the, if, if you are representing the governing party, surely they would think about following the rules. Same as at the Zulu King's uh, recent funeral. No, there was no social distancing, nothing like that. And I think it shows the difference, as I say, the difference in political culture where the, the queen as the side, she needs to set an example, follow the rules as mandated by the government. Yeah, if it's an ANC person's funeral or somebody or an important South African royal, such as the Zulu King, we don't, I mean, then the rules don't have to be followed. But we've seen other places where, you know, during lockdown, I saw weddings getting broken up. I saw uh, there was a clip uh, one time of um, some Muslim people who were praying when you weren't allowed to have gatherings and the police came there and broke it up and right. said insulting things and about... Uh, exactly. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to... Uh, have these rules, but then everybody's got to follow them. Whatever you think about lockdown and uh, all these different kinds of rules. So I think, as I say, that shows a difference in political culture. I mean, I don't think if if, if you saw, I mean, in in any, I mean, most other democracies, I don't think you'd see somebody who assaulted another person, potentially uh, nearly killed them. Uh, in, in any other well-run uh, party in uh, any other democracy around the world, if they'd still be in that uh, political party. And it tells you a lot about the ANC that Andila Lungisa is still actually one of the most prominent people in the ANC. And <laughs> thank God for small mercies, but luckily he's not in cabinet yet, but who knows how long it'll be until he is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, at least he did lose his, his, his seat as a councillor, but I think that's because it's it's illegal to be a councillor and a and, uh, um uh, and be convicted of a serious crime uh so yeah no it's it, it's very telling about i think the general breakdown of the rule of law in, in in south africa um right let's move on to our last story for today which is of course an announcement by president Cyril Ramaphosa uh of plans to expand the port of durban um by a significant degree so i think the port of durban is currently south africa's biggest port uh it does take a lot of a lot of cargo. Uh, Ramaphosa said that they were going to spend 100 billion rand over the next decade on the port, and they would aim on making it easier for more modern and larger ships to enter the port to be able to offload cargo and upgrade its ex its capacity from about 2.9 million containers. Uh, that's how many it can handle at the moment. They want to upgrade it to 11 million containers. So that's a very big upgrade um, and quite ambitious. And uh, we were talking a little bit before the show, you know, you can look at the story in two ways. One is that, you know, this is a good infrastructure project. South Africa's ports have been in need of upgrade for a long time. Um, you know, this is, this is something useful that government can do to actually, if it's going to spend money, this is a more useful thing to spend it on than most other things. But there's another side to this, which is, while some of the idea might be good, the devil is in the details. And um, as, as once again, my, my father cynically remarked, it's much easier to steal the money in KZN than if you built the port and 
Cape Town or something like that. Um, so, Terence, uh, what do you make of this this upgrade? Do you, do you think it's a, a good idea? Well, uh, what uh, what the president was doing uh, this was uh, it was in his, his his weekly letter, and he was sort of more he wasn't announcing um, a new initiative; he was rather confirming uh, that this is uh, uh, this is what they're busy with. Um, yeah, hundred hundred billion bucks. That's that's a lot of money, um, and there is a lot of scope for that to go uh, for that to go awry. However, South Africa, look, South Africa has a um, has has an infrastructure deficit, and this is one that's been coming for a long, long time. Um, when South Africa democratized in the nineteen nineties, the ANC acknowledged that uh, they were inheriting as you know one of the um uh, one of the uh, more positive legacies of the past very really well de- uh, well developed infrastructure um a lot of that was uh, uh, was ignored and not and, and not properly maintained uh, for various reasons um the world cup came around there was a frenzy of um of sprucing up and then it's been kind of left to um uh, uh, left to decline again at one stage our ports uh there were there was such con- there was such concern about the about the delays in, in uh, moving containers that uh, South Africa was being was being kind of charged a, a, a charged a surcharge for uh, uh, for ships to for, for ships to dock. Uh, you know, you could clear cog. Um, I, I forget the exact numbers, but it was like sort of three days or something, as opposed to a few hours in Singapore. Um, now. Th- this unfortunately kind of reverberates through the economy. Um, it's roads that uh, uh, that have been allowed to been allowed to crumble. It's a rail network that is, although quite extensive, is just not is just is just not up to um, uh, up to the task. It's a, a water infrastructure that's now nearing the end of its um, uh, the end of its life. It's it's uh, blackouts. It's Medusi, um, uh, and unfortunately the. Response then comes as the Medusis and Kusilis, you know, uh, massive cost overruns and concerns about their um, about their viability. We've had, this, you know, we've had the same thing with with uh, uh, with water projects. Um, uh, the uh, 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 former premier of of Gauteng who went on to uh, uh, to, uh, to the water sector, you know, apparently had some explaining to do there. Um, so, in principle, yes, you know these are these are upgrades we need. Um, in practice, you know, I suspect that many of us are going to be very disappointed in the way that they are executed. Indeed, uh, Morris, any thoughts in sixty seconds? Uh, not really. I think Terence covered it, but I mean. We always get these announcements of these amazing mega infrastructure projects. I think it'd be interesting. Um, uh, exercise for somebody to go through the various sonas state of the nation addresses going back say 20 years and seeing what was uh, announced by each president during the speech and then seeing what was actually followed through and what wasn't i think you'd be quite shocked or not probably you'd be probably quite unsurprised by what was announced and what was actually done so and i think this is i mean this could well be likely just one of these where the president just throws in a good number throws a dartboard at uh, i mean throws a dart at a map of south africa cool let's build you know, something in Durban, then he spins a thing with a number on it, cool, 100 billion rand, let's build 100 billion rand. And then another thing stops in harbour, could have been a 50 billion rand stadium in Bloemfontein, whatever, you know. So, I think mean, this is kind of it. I mean, hopefully, I mean, the, if the port needs to be upgraded, it needs to be upgraded, hopefully it gets done properly, but yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath, eh? Right, no, exactly. They need to actually do some of the basic maintenance on it first before they can start to think looking to these grand divisions. Um, but, Morris, I think you may have cracked the code. I think you may have determined how President <laughs> Obama was a creates an infrastructure project. He's got three dartboards. Exactly. <laughs> he just takes bullet trains. He's like, no, they'll never be bullet trains. Damn it. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's all the time we have for today. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, please check out the interview that we did as a special episode with Helen Zilla. It will be on the YouTube channel. It's called Helen Zilla on Wokeness. Me and Gabriel Krauser uh, spoke to her uh, about her new book. Um, so that's pretty cool. And yeah. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Cheers, everyone.